Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. We have a great guest tonight yet again. We have Gary Stork of Madison, Wisconsin. Gary is a longtime medical marijuana patient. He's been an advocate in the state of Wisconsin and nationally for medical marijuana. He'll be talking about his uh, longtime use for glaucoma and his organization. It's Is My Medical Marijuana Legal Yet? So uh, stay tuned for that. We have great hip news segment tonight. Uh, so stay tuned as we bring on our infamous dancing cannabis leaf. I feel the force. Okay, our first story tonight is from the Midwest. Ohio activist has placed an adult use marijuana initiative before lawmakers. Ohio Secretary of State Office affirmed that activists have collected a sufficient number of signatures from registered voters to place the marijuana legalization measure before voters. Lawmakers now have four months to either enact the proposal as written, amend it, or ignore it. If lawmakers decide in favor of either of the latter two options, advocates can elect to gather additional signatures to place the measure before voters on the November ballot. As proposed, the Ohio Citizens Initiated Measure allows for the possession of up to 2.5 ounces of marijuana or 15 grams of marijuana extract by those aged 21 and older. Adult Ohioans can purchase marijuana at retail locations or grow up to 12 plants in a private residence where at least two adults reside. Retail cannabis products will be placed taxed at 10%. Municipalities can opt out of allowing retail cannabis sales if the majority of elected officials decide in favor of an ordinance to do so. Here in Oregon, uh, on Tuesday, February 1st, marked the one year anniversary since Measure 110 took effect in Oregon, decriminalizing low level drug possession and increasing funding for harm reduction, substance use disorder treatment, and other key services. According to information from the Drug Policy Alliance, there were 60% fewer total drug arrests in Oregon over the 10 months after February 1st, 2021 compared with the same period the previous year. That 2020 period saw 9,100 drug arrests in total, meaning a reduction of almost 5,500 arrests in 10 months. Measure 110 also requires that a portion of cannabis tax revenue be put into a special fund to expand services for people who use drugs. Before the measure passed, Oregon ranked near the bottom of all U.S. states for access to substance use disorder treatment. Thanks to the measure, the state has already paid out over $31.4 million to providers of services, including treatment, harm reduction, peer support, and housing and employment support. Establishing these systems will be the focus of much work in Oregon's 2022 session, but to date, over 16,000 Oregon residents have already accessed services funded by Measure 110. The largest portion, over 59%, have received harm reduction services like sterile syringes, uh, associated training or safe sex supplies. About 15% receive assistance with housing needs, and many more receive peer services or clinical screening, about 11% each. Less than 1% of the people who access uh, substance use disorder treatment in Oregon during the 10 month period did so with Measure 10 funding. So very little of that is going to drug abuse funding yet. Oregon Senator Tom Katz, a uh, Republican, is sponsoring Senate Bill 1541 as an attempt to give law enforcement more money to combat illicit cannabis cultivation in the state. This bill, if passed, uh, Hearst explained, would divert $15 million from substance use disorder treatment funds each quarter, redirecting it to Oregon State Police. It wouldn't be the first time cannabis tax money has been used in this way. Challenges and battles remain, therefore, but thousands of people in Oregon whether receiving services or avoiding arrest, have already felt benefits from Measure 110. Here in the United States, the NFL, or National Football League, on Tuesday announced that it has authorized 
$1.1 million in grants for two studies looking into the efficacy of marijuana and its components in managing football players' pain and providing neural protection from concussions. A commission of the NFL and the league's players' union first previewed the funding plan in June, emphasizing the strong interest among players and other stakeholders in exploring the therapeutic benefits of cannabinoids, particularly as an alternative to opioid painkillers. There were more than 100 applications from researchers to carry out the studies, and the commission selected two, one from the University of California at San Diego and the other from the University of Regina in Canada. The newly funded research initiatives will take three years to complete. NFL players no longer face the possibility of being suspended from games over positive tests for any drug, not just marijuana, under a collective bargaining agreement. Instead, they'll face a fine. The threshold for what constitutes a positive THC test was also increased under the deal. Drug testing policies have been revised in other sports leagues in recent years as well. The National Basketball Association announced late last year that it is extending its policy of not randomly drug testing players for marijuana through 2021-22 season. The association won't be subjecting players to random drug testing for THC either. In a similar vein, the Major League Baseball uh, decided in 2019 to remove cannabis from the league's list of banned substances. Baseball players can consume marijuana without risk of discipline, but officials clarified late last year that they can't work while under the influence and can't enter into sponsorship contracts with cannabis businesses, at least for the time being. Down in Southern California, a lawsuit by an armored car company accuses the FBI or Federal Bureau of Investigation and the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department of illegally seizing cash it was transporting for licensed cannabis companies in California, according to a report from the Los Angeles Times. Ephemeral Logistics, the armored car company, alleges the Sheriff's Department seized more than $1.1 million in cash over two stops, and the FBI is trying to confiscate the cash, claiming it's tied to federal drug or money laundering crimes, but the agency has specified no unlawful conduct and hasn't charged anyone with the crime. During the first stop in the Mojave Desert Freeway in November, the driver of the armored car was carrying $712,000 in cash from licensed cannabis companies when San Bernardino County Sheriff's deputies pulled him over, interrogated him, and seized the cash. A few weeks later, the same department, same deputy, stopped the same driver and seized another $350,000 that was being transported for state-approved cannabis businesses. Ephemeral verifies that the dispensaries whose money it carries are in good standing with state regulators. They transport the money to banks. The company's lawsuit describes the traffic stops of their trucks as highway robbery by government agents. Ephemeral says federal law enforcement agents are trying to pad their budgets with forfeiture money. Usually those go to conferences and trips and little gizmos in their, their office. None of Ephemeral's drivers ever got so much as a traffic citation in the case. That's pretty interesting since traffic violations were the claimed reason for pulling them over in the first place. Video footage from the van captured the deputies counting the cash from the $350,000 seizure and the deputies voiced their disappointment that it wasn't more money. $350,000 was not enough for them. I guess they, they had some group vacation they could have gone on if they just got a few hundred thousand more. This case is in the U.S. District of Court in Riverside, California. Washington, D.C. lawmakers on Tuesday approved a measure to expand access to the district's medical marijuana program in a series of ways. The D.C. Council voted unanimously to allow senior citizens to self-certify their own eligibility for cannabis without, without having to get a recommendation from a doctor, further extend the registration renewal deadline for patients, and create a week-long medical marijuana tax relief holiday that coincides with the unofficial cannabis event known as 420. In 2014, the District of Columbia legalized medical marijuana and adult use, but to date, only medical dispensaries have been approved and open. This emergency legislation is meant to ease logistical burdens for patients in the jurisdiction and incentivize people to obtain cannabis from licensed dispensaries rather than to buy their products from the gray market vendors who've taken advantage of a workaround related to the district's policy of allowing for marijuana gifting between adults. Finally, the measure creates an incentive to keep people out of the gray market by creating a 420 medical cannabis sales tax holiday week, where medical cannabis patients would not pay the 6% sales tax for the period of Friday, April 20th through Sunday, April 24th, 2022. Our last story tonight is from New Zealand. Smoking cannabis long-term is not associated with the same physiological consequences on lung health 
as is tobacco smoking, according to data published in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. A team of New Zealand researchers examined the long-term effects of cannabis smoking and our tobacco smoking in a cohort of 881 middle-aged adults. Consistent with prior studies, the researchers reported that cannabis inhalation was associated with higher total lung capacity and other physiological changes that are distinct from the health consequences associated with tobacco smoking. The authors concluded, quote, it's increasingly clear that cannabis has different effects on lung function as compared to tobacco, and the effect of widespread cannabis use will not necessarily mirror the harms caused by tobacco smoking, end quote. The findings are consistent with prior research, concluding that cannabis smoke and tobacco smoke are not equally carcinogenic. The cannabis inhalation exposes consumers to fewer toxicants than does tobacco smoking, and that marijuana smoke exposure is typically not associated with the same health consequences as is tobacco smoking, including a less increased risk of COPD or lung cancer. Moreover, the use of vaporization technology, which heats herbal cannabis to a set temperature below the point of combustion, is associated with reduced exposure to toxic gases and has been identified as a safe and effective cannabis delivery device in clinical trials. This study, Differential Effects of Cannabis and Tobacco on Lung Function in Mid-Adult Life, appears in this month's edition of the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. That is the end of our Hemp News segment tonight. Stay tuned for our uh, interview with Gary Stork and the Is My Medicine Legal Yet group in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we want to tell you, uh, if you are looking for a physician who can help you get a medical marijuana permit in your state, we have a referral service. You can call us at 503-235-4606. That's 503-235-4606. Here is Gary Stork with Is My Medicine Legal Yet in Madison, Wisconsin, an old friend of ours. Stay tuned and help us restore him. Good night. I would like to introduce an old friend here from Madison, Wisconsin, Gary Stork. Hey, I'm hey Gary. Well. Very well, very well. So, Gary, you have been an activist for a long, long time. And I have quite a story how you were one of the people approved for medical marijuana from the federal government, but then they just, President Bush the first, I guess you'd say, or senior, W's daddy, he, uh, H.W., uh, he ended the program while you were on the way. Well, actually, work. I never got that far. I did huh. get the paperwork from Bob Randall in uh, yeah. like 1977. Yeah. But I couldn't find a doctor who would sign me up. My doctor who had been seeing me at the time was a regular pri private practice doctor, and he just didn't want to deal with the paperwork. He did write yeah. me a letter that was a, a form letter that Bob sent me that, that said that he would prescribe it if it were available for him to do so. <clears throat> but I could never find a doctor, so I n unfortunately never got that far. Why don't we digress even further back to how you first became aware of medical marijuana. And you've been on our show before when you were here in Portland and we were in our cable studio that we haven't been in since the start of the pandemic, though we hope to go back someday. Uh, but tell us how you became a mar marijuana activist and how you first started using marijuana and, and discovered its medicinal value. Well, when I was born uh, almost 67 years ago, uh, I came into the world with a number of uh, congenital conditions. And one of those was uh, um, glaucoma. And, uh, and as a small child, I began losing a lot of vision. My eyes hurt a lot. Uh, every family photo that was facing into the sun, I'd be like this, because I was so photophobic from the sun and the light. And, um, and finally they got me to an eye doctor and they, they put me on the meds that were available at the time, which was like pilocarpine and ezrine. And, and uh, they really didn't do the job completely. My pressures were always high. You know, I, I moved from the 
the back of the classroom to the front row so I could see. I, I was prescribed glasses. You know, I was going blind. I was I was raised Roman Catholic, you know, and uh, used to pray every night. I wouldn't go blind. And um, in the early 70s, I began seeing news articles about federal, re <clears throat> federal research at UCLA on um, cannabis and glaucoma. And so <clears throat> it was hard for me to find cannabis back then. I think the first time I smoked some was uh, before a, a Fleetwood Mac, Rory Gallagher, Mothers of Invention show, Frank Zappa in 1971. But I still didn't know that it uh, could help my glaucoma. Now, yeah, what was the, the, the Mothers of Invention and Fleetwood Mac show? What? What year did you first smoke marijuana at that show? October 1971. I see. Okay. And I got high for the first time. I knew I was high, you know. And I yeah. may have smoked before that, but I got but high. You didn't notice it affecting your eyes that you knew about. I really hadn't time. put the two together, but um, because I couldn't get enough of it to get a, you know, a, a continuous effect. But as right. the year went on, I got more and more. And then uh, one day before an appointment, I smoked some really good cannabis for the for the Times, October 3rd, 1972. And my mother drove me into the eye doctor in Milwaukee. And uh, I was 17 years old, high school senior. And he'd been seeing me since I was six or seven. He checked my pressures and, and they were normal. They normally been like 22 or higher, you know, and they were 13, 12, 12 and, uh, and 14, I think. And uh -huh. I didn't want to know why, but I knew from that day that this could save my sight. And uh, did you share that information with your, you were a young teenager at that time? Did you share that with your ophthalmologist? Not that day. I was still. Uh, because it was illegal and I was a kid, I didn't feel comfortable right. doing so. Sure, but of I, course. A light went off in my head that, wow. Well, so, you know. did you at some point share that with your parents that this marijuana stuff is helping my? Yeah, I can't remember exactly when, but uh, my mother was particularly supportive as she was. I was also born with. Uh, um, heart defects, and uh, had to have two heart surgeries in 1971. And um, she worked for a doctor, and uh, later in the 1970s, had him write a letter saying that, you know, I had glaucoma and I used THC, as it was written in the letter, for it. Because there's a Wisconsin law that it's common to most states. It's in the Federal Controlled Substances Act, that if you have a valid order of a practitioner, you can use a controlled substance. Mm -hmm. So I had that protection. And then I got the letter from my ophthalmologist that was drafted by Bob Randall. So I had two of those already by 1978. I see. I see. And so 78 was when you were trying to get into the the IMD compassionate use program. And I think that was ended by Bush the first in yeah, 91, wasn't it? Jackie had been approved, Jackie Rickard. That's what I was thinking. She was that approved yeah. for both research and medical use. She had a doctor in Mondovi who just believed what she was saying, you know. He'd seen how bad it was and he saw how much it could help. He went and did the research. He got Todd Micaria's book. You know, he got immersed himself in it. This was a country doctor up in Mondovi, Wisconsin, you know. All right. The county in the middle of nowhere. You and Jackie Rickard, for our audience, Jackie Rickard is a, a longtime medical marijuana patient that worked with Gary. And Gary has been an activist with the uh, is my medicine legal yet, right? Or I M M L, and uh, I am M L. 
Yeah. It's been, uh, uh, when did you first become active in terms of trying to, to advocate on behalf of the medical marijuana? Well, in the late seventies, I, I, um, got in touch with Andy Kane, who was running with Wisconsin normal at the time. And he put me in touch with Bob Randall and Alice O'Leary, who at the time had been given an office at Normal. And Bob yeah. Randall was the very first person to get medical marijuana through that IND program. And he was also a right. coma patient. And um, he, he um, had his medical supply cut off by the federal government. They got his doctor to move somewhere. and. And he sued them, and I was one of five glaucoma patients who used cannabis who submitted anonymous affidavits in support of his case, mm-hmm. along with a lot of other medical conditions and stuff. And um, his records are up at the Wisconsin Historical Society on the UW campus. I okay. visited them. Okay. Just can can go through his records at at University yeah, of Wisconsin. Yeah, just uh, it's just um, feet from where normal where the uh, harvest fest has been held all these years. It's yeah. right across yeah. the courtyard there. And uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I go in there and use the the bathroom when I'm yeah. there at the, the harvest festival. That's the the easiest and best access uh, restroom there. Went, went up there in 2016 and uh, looked at them, and it didn't take me long to find. I have the copy, a copy of the affidavit I signed with my name on it, but I found the uh, the one, and I was uh, listed as um, John Rowe or something like that, or mm-hmm. but uh, you know, it was my information, and it was pretty cool to see that and. Um, out of the five patients, three of them were much older than me. They're probably not around anymore. Uh, did you grow up in Madison or did you move to Madison? I grew up in Waukesha. Uh huh. And um, lived there until my early 20s and then went to school for a semester in Stevens Point and then uh, Milwaukee for a number of years. And I didn't move to Madison. Until 1995, after I returned after living in California and San Francisco and Berkeley for a dozen years. Had you been aware of the Great Midwest Marijuana Harvest Fest, which is the oldest annual event still ongoing for marijuana legalization in general? I guess it started in 71. And yeah. So no, when did you first find aware. out the the marijuana march there in Madison? I didn't go to my first, believe it or not, until 1995. I happened huh. to be downtown with my brother and uh, nephew, and and uh, all of a sudden the parade was coming up State Street, and you know we couldn't help but join in. So that was my introduction to it, but. Um, I was there in 96, 97. I was there and uh, with Jackie Rickard and the Journey for Justice people and uh, went to pretty much everyone, you know, and until the last few years. Well, tell us more about your association with Jackie Rickard and, and tell our audience about the organization and then we'll talk about the Journey for Justice. Yeah, well, it kind of... Uh, it kind of runs together. Um, in 1997, uh, in September, the Journey for Justice had left from Mondovi, and um, it was going to take them eight days <clears throat> to get to Madison. Uh, they had uh, people in wheelchairs and uh, power wheelchairs and then support vehicles, and they would stay somewhere every night. And so I followed its progress. and. Uh, at the time, I was recovering from a, a very serious um, infection I'd had following an aortic valve replacement in August of that year. <clears throat> I had my um, aortic valve had failed, that had been repaired in 1971, 
<clears throat> they gave me a pig valve in early August of uh, 71 or 97, but I see, they, I see. they removed the staples in my groin where they placed the hard lung pump. They inadvertently infected me with uh, uh, MRSA. Oh, no. <laughs> within 48 hours, I was deathly ill. And within 24 more hours, I went to the hospital and they took me immediately into surgery and began cutting away the infection out of my groin. And um, I remember saying, well, so I, I don't think I'm going home tonight, right? And they go, no. And, <clears throat> and then they took me back and, and knocked me out. And, and I was there for 14 days. And wow. um, oh, yeah. Yeah. this was after my surgery. I've only been in for six days for that. <clears throat> and I had a bunch of surgeries. And, um, and so I was still bleeding from the wound in my groin. They'd, uh, <clears throat> they tried everything. They, uh, they couldn't stop it from bleeding. One night, they even put me in bed with a, like a 10-pound sand, sand bag on it. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> then they cauterized it. And, uh, and they finally sent me home. They had a nurse come in every day to check it. <clears throat> So I was still really weak and uh, still actually had a bandage on it and it was bleeding a little. But I went down to the Capitol to meet the journey and, uh, and George uh, McMahon was with them. And before they got there, I, I met him and I had a really nice talk with him. And you know, another hero of ours, another uh, IND patient. Yes. And so that was really great. And then Jackie showed up and um, and I followed them around the Capitol, and they were in an office talking to a representative. And I was out in the hallway kind of lurking around, and, and she saw me, and she goes, come on and join us. And uh, so I, I came in, and uh, that was how we met. Um, she also ran over my foot with her power chair at one point. So uh, also had that going, you know. But we began to talk more on the phone. and. Uh, and um, she knew Jim and Cheryl Miller, and we started talking to them and uh, went to Washington, D.C. in October of 99 and ended up occupying Bob Barr's office doorway because he had pushed through legislation blocking uh, medical marijuana from taking effect in D.C., even though they voted it in. And uh, Jim and Cheryl were arrested and detained. Me and Jackie elected to leave rather than get arrested. They gave Cheryl back to us because they'd already arrested her once a year earlier. And they didn't want somebody who basically couldn't move anything below her neck. And uh, so we had, we took care of Cheryl while Jim was detained both up at the Capitol area police station and then taken downtown. And uh, I went to, we went to uh, MPP, Maryland Policy Project, and, and they put some stuff up. But we also went to Smithsonian and I put something out on cannabisnews.com and we actually uh, scooped MPP. And uh, I went, went to one of their computers there and got online, you know. And then um, because uh, MPP didn't feed us, I went and got, like, candy bars at Union Station for us to eat. And, uh, and you know, and then Jim got out. And uh, we also filmed the commercial. Now, that was later. Um, Jim got out, and, and it was... Uh, Quite the day, you know. We tried to keep it a secret, but you know, the Capitol Police knew we were coming. But uh, it was an amazing day. Yeah, it sounds like it. It sounds like it. So it was kind of a baptism of fire for me. Jim dubbed us the Commando Squad. We all stayed in a hotel uh, like eight blocks away. Yeah, when you open the windows. On the sixth floor, you could see the Capitol 
you know, and Jim would get up at like 5 a.m. because he had to get all these things with Cheryl, you know, to get her ready for the day. And uh, and so we were up. The room was full of medical equipment and all kinds of wheelchairs and, you know, just really crazy, you know. And, and, and that's how I became an activist, you know. And it's like we decided to do this thing at Bob Barr's office, you know. We're sitting there on the floor looking up at all these cops and stuff. And, you know, they finally they said, you know, you can either leave or get arrested. And we left and uh, went to Tom Barrett's office, who was later the Wisconsin congressional candidate several times, lost to Scott Walker, was the mayor of Milwaukee and just got appointed ambassador to Luxembourg. <laughs> so you went to his office, though. Yeah. And they came out and uh, they gave us Cheryl back. And and that's how we started the rest of the day. I see. Yeah. Tell us about the Journey for Justice events. That Did you participate in those directly? I know Jackie did. And yeah, I was there when they, when they hit the Capitol and I went to... Uh, I went into a meeting with them in, uh, yeah. in the Capitol with Tommy Thompson was out of town, but some of his staff were there and uh, and Jackie passed around her bottle of Marinol and, and they opened it up and dumped some in their hands, you know, which I thought was kind of weird and, and looked at it and put it back in. She was approved. She was uh, prescribed Marinol. The government wanted to give her Marinol, but she was allergic to it. And, uh, took some because they kept pushing it and her throat started closing up and her doctor, Dr. Wright, put like a tube down her throat so she could breathe. So Marinol wouldn't work for her, you know, and and um, all of us who were in the journey and then hangers on like me, we all were in this meeting in, in the governor's conference room. And then later we went to uh, a hotel where they were staying and I also met John Precup, who uh, was on the journey, and he's still an activist in Ohio, uh, MS patient, and uh, Ray Berry from Ohio. And uh, a lot of people like Cheryl Miller, who you were mentioning, and Jackie Rickard, of course, have passed on here. I know Jackie just passed about five, four or five years ago. Yeah. But uh, there's still you some. Were, um, in early 99, I also went to a, a hearing for the action class for cannabis therapeutics in Philadelphia. Uh huh. Larry Hirsch's lawsuit. Okay. Sure you're familiar with that. There was uh, 165 original patients. Jackie Ricker was among them. Uh, Angel Rach was in there, but she was known as Train Lady or Debbie somebody at the time. Uh, Dana Peel was there. Um, Sister Samaya. Mm -hmm. Just a shitload of people. And I went to this this uh, hearing or this in the court case with a bunch of the patients and, and the judge. And he seemed really, um, really sympathetic to our that's where I first met Jim and Cheryl, too, in the elevator going up to the sixth floor. He seemed really sympathetic to us, like he he might um, put us all in the IND program, but later he dismissed the case. But uh, So I met Jody James there from Florida, um, just people from all over, and that was really a great day, too. We went to the, the Philadelphia... Um, Liberty Bell, and I snuck a joint outside, and and I uh, got to see that. I was just there for like a, a day, but it was really a pivotal moment in my uh, early activism career. I know recently you have put out a book, and I had the honor of uh, reviewing a, an advanced copy. You have a copy of it there. You want to show? Oh, no, I haven't seen that. I'd like to. No, I mean your book. Yeah, I'd like to. Yeah, see here your it book. is. It's 
the rise and fall of cannabis prohibition in Wisconsin. So that came out, uh, it's been about a year? It came out in November 2019. And uh, just as I was beginning in earnest to market it, I I went into the Milwaukee to the first Wisconsin Cannabis Expo and had a booth there. I was selling it. and uh, But then the pandemic hit, you know, so I couldn't uh, have, you know, things at bookstores or anything like that. And uh, so I really um, haven't been able to do much as far as marketing it due to the pandemic, but um, it's available on Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble and Walmart and and all them. And I have a page called uh, cannabadgermedia.com where you can read reviews of it and uh, you can order it on there. But you can probably get a better deal online at some of the other ones. And um, one of the things, I, my mom, uh, who just passed away uh, January 12th at uh, almost 102 years old, she had encouraged me for years to finish this book, even before I knew the form it was going to be. And so I dedicated the book to her. And it came out at 388 pages. Um, it's uh, two parts. The the first part is longer stories, and I, I mention every cannabis-related bill that's ever been passed by the legislature, either making it illegal or making it more illegal. And every bill introduced to uh, reform cannabis laws. Um, the second half um, is more little blurbs about what happened uh, from 1995 on, on specific days. And uh, I've got an index in it, which uh, you can look up people's names and uh, All right. see who's in there and stuff like that. And uh, came out at 388 pages. Uh, it's a lot of information, but you can just pick it up anywhere and start reading and learn something about Wisconsin and cannabis. And uh, Talk about Harvest Fest, the first one, and uh, some of the later ones. And um, let me ask you this: I was one of the people who wrote Harvest Fest. Before you you moved to Wisconsin, had you ever heard of this event? No, it was happening here. I but I just Milwaukee and, and Waukesha were like a different world than Madison, and, and there wasn't an internet or anything. That, I may have heard of it. I know one time some friends and I came up to something like Harvest Fest in the spring. We'd heard about it, you know, and, and we thought we, we couldn't get any weed in, in Waukesha at the time. So we thought, I'll go up there, you know, we'll get high. But we couldn't even get find any pot there to get right. high. Right. So, right. Yeah. I remember I went to my first Harvest Fest in... Uh, what was it? 1989. And in, in the one in 1990 is where I gave my very first public speech from a stage, uh, like at an event. I, I had done some normal meeting presentations of reefer madness at colleges in Western Washington in the early 80s. But in terms of getting on a stage and specifically speaking, that was my first event there in Madison. Yeah, I, I mentioned ago. that you were at attended those along with uh, Jack Herrera yeah. and uh, Dana and some other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The pictures I, I still have a lot of pictures from then, and what a few of the pictures are. Well, one of them in particular is a uh, photo on Wikipedia for both Dana Beal and Jack. Harris uh, uh, Wikipedia listings. So that's kind of cool. I put it out there on public domain. I searched domain. through old newspapers, and that's where I got my my description of the first Harvest Fest in here and uh, from different news articles. And it's really great because uh, they went into the uh, park shelter at Brittingham Park and smoked a bunch of weed. And uh, Ben wasn't involved in but the people that were, they claimed that they smoked 40 pounds of pot which I think, you know, uh, it seems like a lot, but uh, 
Yeah, you know, that's what they that's what they said, and then they they marched to the Capitol, and uh, so it was pretty amazing, you know, these early days, and uh, it was also kind of a free Dana Beal from a uh, one of Dana's. Yeah, yeah that was the gist there. of it. You know, I didn't I didn't know about this till uh, really maybe till like ten years ago that Dana was here, you know, living for several years in the late sixties, even. Madison was, you know, a totally different place back then than, you know, 10 years later. And even today, you know, it was a really radical town. And uh, a lot of things were going on here that, you know, a lot of people were here. And, and yeah, there was a big bombing at the University of Wisconsin's chemistry lab. I yeah. think they, they put on, I forget which group it was right now off the top of my head, but. Uh, maybe it was the weather underground, and uh, they uh, it was they you know it's part of the the Nixon's war it on was the really hatched well. by four yeah, guys, and uh, uh, one of them uh, I've known a couple of them. One of them they never found. Uh, the, the one I knew the best uh, died of cancer about um, ten or so years ago. Um, then there's Carlton. Armstrong, I think he's still around, and uh, and he got out of jail. You know, they both did. They weren't. They, you know, if it happened today, it would have been life. But uh, so they came, got out, and uh, lived around town for a while and stuff. And um, it was too bad that people got killed. One guy got killed, but that's how uh, deep the opposition to the war was here, and uh, how radical parts of town had gotten at that time. Well, Carl I think the strong time. They operated a sandwich shop on State yeah. Street uh, called Radical Rye. <laughs> right. It was open um, in the early 2000s, I think. Right. Well, definitely a different era back then, for sure. Yeah. People have so, said, you know, why do you call this rise and fall of cannabis prohibition in Wisconsin, you know, it's still illegal. But um, the case I make in this book is that basically um, it's decriminalized and you're not going to get in a lot of trouble. And like in Madison, they, now they won't even take away up to an ounce of weed if they catch you with it in the areas where you're not allowed to publicly smoke it you know yeah, so but yeah. you're now allowed to publicly smoke marijuana any place you can use tobacco is in madison yeah, only. something like that you know so and not that they even would care anyways you know they're very busy dealing with car thefts and, and break-ins and stuff like that you know they don't have time for cannabis they never really have but now more than ever so and uh you can go down to illinois and right across the wisconsin border to south beloit and buy cannabis anybody from wisconsin can buy 15 grams of cannabis or you know certain amounts of wax or oil or edibles and and you can go to Michigan and buy weed. So if you really want to try it, you can get it. If you don't have a guy, you know. So it's not like they really care about it anymore. You know, it's just a matter of time until the laws are changed at the state level. Right. Well, uh, eventually they will. I know that you've had a real political battle the Republican Party and gerrymandering and a very closely divided electorate that has, uh, you haven't been able to get uh, much medical marijuana, right? What is the current status of the marijuana, medical marijuana statewide? Well, if you have a valid order of a practitioner, you have a legal defense for it. Right. But Talk to our audience about how you came in 1981. Bob yeah, Russell came, came here in 79, you know, and uh, most states passed laws like that. 
but it only ended up allowing Marinol, but it did put the state on record as allowing it, as in favor. But so, so tell us about, you came to the THCF Medical Clinic here in Portland with Jackie Rickard. What year was that? Was it 2000 and? It was uh, 2010 when the normal conference was out there. Uh, we took the right, train right. out from right, um, right. Wisconsin. No, um, yeah, Wisconsin Dells, I think, recorded something like that. And, no. I know cool. you made a video about yeah, it. Yeah, it's well online with Jackie. on uh, YouTube under um, Jackie Gets Legal in Oregon. I think you would could find it well, by. Uh, it's mentioned it now we'll have to run it right here in the middle of the show so here's the video from 2000 is it night 2010 2010 all right so here we are on the way to the THC foundation to get jack illegal is that an what do you have to say, Jack? Huh? What do you have to say on this auspicious day? I say somebody better come through or I'm going to be really upset. <laughs> I would love you to have the doctor. Do you want me to stay? Wait, the drug government. Everybody just let me down. They have contracts. They go nowhere. Well. Today, things are going to be different. I hope so. I pray to God. I pray to God. Anybody else here? We're finally here. I got my car. I got my car. I really nice doctor. He sounded kind of like Ozzy almost. <laughs> it was a pretty good blog he was. So how do you feel, Jackie? You're legal almost. I feel One like more stuff. Batman was twice the man. The government people that were at the FDA night and blah 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 blah. DEA. There was a compassionate doctor. The doctor right who knew what was the right thing to do. As he said, he's never smoked marijuana in his life, but he believes people who are in pain and all the different problems should have it. It's a plant given to us by God. It's the way it should be. Period. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. I mean, it's a plant. It should be. It's a, it's a yes, 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 yes. There's nothing bad about it, nothing other than the illegality. But we're going to change in that, and it's going to happen. So in a couple seconds, we'll be going in to file the paperwork, the final step to make Jackie a legal Oregon patient. Yay! When I come walking out, I will be handing you the stamped paperwork. Do you have my ID? Sure. Yes. Thank you. See it's you in a couple a very minutes. Pleasant day. Beautiful. Look at that beautiful building, those two beautiful flags. The United States of America and Oregon. Wisconsin, okay. learn something. Something the federal government said they'd do 20 years ago. We're finally taken care of today, at least for some places.
This is Joe's copy. So for you, this character of the copy of it. See it stamped from the state of Oregon. Is that cool? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> this is cool! Whee! Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it always works in the movies. <laughs> <laughs> So that was a great video you, you made back then for Jackie. Tell us how it went after that. Well, I know uh, how did you, you received your cards in the mail. Yeah, and we, and then other people from Wisconsin, them, uh, you know, uh, yeah, including yeah. Uh, my friend Karen Kinsley, uh, her and her husband Greg are, are uh, Madison based cannabis activists, and uh, I've done a lot of cannabis activists with them. And uh, we went up to Fighting Bob Fest, which was a, a political festival they had in Baraboo in um, 2015 and uh, drove up in a van that they had and uh, they had their dog in the van. And it was about in the mid fifties that day, not warm out really. And they, uh, their dog was barking while we were at the festival and um, they tried paging us on the sound system and we didn't hear him. So eventually uh, somebody called the cops. And when Greg and I got back to the van, the cops are waiting and they looked inside and seen a pipe <clears throat> with some uh, cannabis in it, or alleged cannabis. And uh, they were very angry at Greg. And, uh, and so I went and got Karen. I wasn't implicated at all. And uh, by the time I got back with Karen a couple minutes later, uh, Greg was showing the cop, one of the cops, his letter from his doctor on his phone, and, um, and then Karen showed her uh, card and her letter, and uh, then I began bringing up cases like a case that had occurred in in uh, Baraboo in 2004, where a woman who had gone to California, Cheryl Lamb had been bitten by a brown recluse spider and had gotten a California recommendation from Dr. Todd Micaria, um, had been arrested in Baraboo camping and uh, for some cannabis and they dismissed the case because of her um, letter from Dr. Todd. So I started bringing up that case and they were at, still at that point talking about the illegalness of it, the legality. And it was like a light switch. Their attitudes just completely changed when they brought up versus Wisconsin. And, uh, you know, after that, it was like, oh, we wish it were legal too, you know. And, and I was surreptitiously um, having pictures with my camera, holding it in my hand. And, uh, shooting it like that and uh -huh. yeah. and uh they wouldn't give back the cannabis but uh they didn't arrest anybody you know citations were issued uh when we got back to madison i contacted a freelancer for the baraboo news republic got her told her the story got her the picture of the cops talking to my friends and uh the dog and uh, they got a nice article out of it, and um, and then later uh, the city attorney said that no charges would be would be um, pressed against them, and another article was printed with the same author. So uh, <clears throat> that was the biggest win I think I've ever right. put so yeah. in a to help other patients in Wisconsin on a couple of occasions and other patients from Wisconsin. Like you said, you came to our Denver office and saw one of our doctors who was licensed both in Colorado and in Oregon to renew your card. Uh, yes, uh, patients were so grateful to me. Another patient, he was uh, divorced and his wife was giving him, his ex-wife was really giving him a lot of grief about his cannabis use. His medical use and uh she was going to try and take away their kid from him being able to see the kid and with that card he showed that to a judge 
And after that, it was over for her. And he got no more visitation issues. You could see the kid, no more problems, you know. And, and having that card, you know, was a, a lifesaver for him. That it restored his connection to his child, you know. And, and there was wow. Problems. It's always That's been a big that access, And that card and your ability, you know, you're helping people here. Help so many people in this state. It's always been a blessing to be able to help so many people. You know, it's it's to it's a wonderful thing to to be involved with. And, and you know, I'm still I'm still doing it. We're still seeing a few patients here in Oregon and Washington, and we're referring patients all over the country to other doctors as well. So, uh, but but uh, it's it's really an honor to be able to be involved on this level. It's something I didn't anticipate when it first started, but. Anyway, um, yeah, it's really part of something historic, you know, and you can you got you can be so proud about that that all the people you helped, you know, and back then, you know, just looking at the people from all the different states that had cards, you know, in the program, really just stunning, you know, and yeah. all together. <laughs> I know it's it's almost incomprehensible, but. We had uh, 45 different doctors working in 60 different cities across nine different states and helped over 270,000 Americans wow. get their medical marijuana permits so they could legally possess, use, and grow the herb. So just put that out there. So, but yeah. your book, we're about ready to wrap up on time, Gary. If somebody wants to get your book, they should, you think, go to Amazon? Yeah, go to you can find it on Amazon or uh, show it up uh, again there. Let's let's Barnes see. And Noble. Um, well, that's Walmart a picture has it. Boston Capitol there, right at the Harvest Fest, yeah. which is the oldest marijuana event in America since 1971. Yeah, it's still and, uh, it's, it's uh, 388 pages. Uh, if somebody wants an autograph copy, can they get an autograph copy? Yeah, um, there should be. I know my uh, the cannabadgermedia.com website has uh, moved to new hosting, so there's a we'll there's get that on Help there where you can order it. But I don't know if that is functional at that time. But if somebody well, wants to we'll, we'll give me check. an email, you know, I can definitely sell them an autograph copy. We'll put your email up here. So that people can contact you via email if they want to get an autograph copy. You can yeah, work that out. It's um right. cannabadgermedia at gmail.com. That's pretty easy. Cannabadgermedia. With two N's in can. Or, yeah. All right. Thanks. Well, we've been talking to Gary Stork, a longtime activist and medical marijuana patient. It's the Badger Media logo. Uh, all right. Thanks for coming on, Gary. Yeah, thanks for having me, Paul. It's really All been right. great. Talk to you soon. Yep. Hope to be up there next October for the Great Midwest Marijuana Harvest Fest.